Hi there and welcome to the third official installment of the Sage Running Podcast. I want to thank all you guys for all your tremendous support uh, following. You could subscribe on iTunes. Uh, you could watch it as a YouTube video here. We got the picture back here, um, full video. Can't believe how much space these, these audio files take up. I'm uh, drinking a Avery Brewing Chai High uh, beer here if you're watching the YouTube video. Chai High Spiced Ale uh, with Spiced Chai Tea Added. It's actually really good. I usually don't even like, uh, I don't like chai tea really that much, but I do kind of like the flavor, like in baked goods. And Avery, sponsor plug, they did a really amazing job of mixing this into 5.2% uh, alcohol beer. And it's uh, great for the fall. I feel like, uh, you know, it's not quite fall yet, but uh, whatever. Uh, so today's podcast, I promise you I will get to having guests on the show eventually. I do really, really want to do that. Uh, and I've already got people in mind that I have to ask, but I uh, really want to keep the momentum going. And yeah, thanks for tuning in. The support's been amazing. So couldn't do this without you guys. Um, this episode, I just want to talk a little bit about kind of the thoughts, the mindset in terms of uh, preparation and expectation, I guess, going into a big ultra race, a long ultra race. Like for me, this case being uh, my second, well, hopefully second 100 mile finish, uh, third 100 mile start. Um, so just kind of the what's going through my head on race week, gearing up for this big 100 mile race at Run Rabbit Run, which actually starts on Friday uh, in, in a few days where I'll be heading out there. So yeah, so it's, it's a little nerve-wracking. I'll just kind of talk about, I guess, my, my taper in training, but also things I'm packing, uh, the mental side of things, just 100-mile race prep in general, and kind of what I've learned in my relatively limited experience of racing 100-mile distance, uh, but maybe something that you could apply to racing your first 100, or if you've yeah, I know a lot of listeners are probably a lot more experienced than me at racing 100-mile ultras, uh, but, you know, even if it's a, a 100K or, or your first 50-miler or something like that, uh, or your first marathon, uh, I think there's a lot of things that are kind of applicable, and so we'll kind of get into that. Uh, and then maybe I'll rant off a little bit on some general nutrition stuff. It won't be a full... full uh, plant-based rant, we should say, uh, but it, it'll be about kind of just bias uh, in terms of looking at scientific studies, peer-reviewed studies, and uh, just kind of the psychology, relatively, you know, basic observations, I guess, but just kind of things I've seen uh, being uh, pretty fairly active on social media and kind of debating these, well, I shouldn't say debating, I don't have been any hot seat debates, but just, uh, well, you know, tweeting back and forth at people or seeing comments on certain blog posts or videos and just tooling around on YouTube, watching other uh, plant-based videos and hearing other podcasts and roasts and things like that. Just, uh, you know, some of my opinions and my take on that. And if you don't like that kind of stuff, I mean, that's fine. Uh, you could just turn off the, the podcast right there. And uh, I, it's not, this isn't going to be a nutrition podcast. This is mainly going to be about preparation for a uh, hundred, oh, I bumped my microphone there, preparation for the Run Rabbit Run 100. So let's get into it. I need a sip of beer first though. <clears throat> wow, that's really good. Okay, so uh, yeah, 100 miles. Despite what Carl Meltzer, my Hoka teammate says, I think it's a long way. And uh, he's actually out there, Carl's out there right now, going after the Appalachian Trail record. And I think he's on pace to maybe break it. I think he's got Scott Jurek out there helping him out, helping pace him, uh, which is really cool to see. Uh, and you could, I've seen some pictures. I don't know the full details, but I mean, Carl's out there definitely lost a lot of weight. I think it's probably impossible to do something so far like the Appalachian Trail or a long stage race uh, without losing weight. And I don't think that really matters what you're eating uh, obviously, a lot of people go for really calorie-dense meals or whatever they could get down. 
uh, you're just, you absolutely, since you're moving so much and you're covering 50 miles a day, uh, that's a rough average. I don't know the exact math, but he had to, I know he has to cover around 50 miles a day now, uh, through rugged terrain. The AT is pretty rugged. Um, yeah, it's going to burn a lot of calories. <laughs> you're going to be in a deficit. It's uh, that's a very tough thing to do with sleep deprivation and overuse stress on your body. Uh, and I, you know, one day I think I'd like to get into stuff like that, uh, or at least do some stage races. Uh, I like kind of the idea of going day after day, going long and, and hard, but uh, right now it's it's a matter of doing uh, a hundred mile race, and we're talking about the Run Rabbit Run, Steamboat Springs, Colorado. It's got about eighteen thousand feet of climbing. I think it's actually about a hundred five miles in distance. But what's what's another extra couple miles when after you've gone a hundred, really? Um, and it, it starts. Uh, there's a the more I guess competitive race uh, for the big prize money purse starts at noon it's a noon start time uh, whereas if, if you want to start early you could start I think it's like 7 a.m. or 6 a.m. or 8 a.m. Uh, that's for the hair or for the tortoises the hairs start at noon so I'll be starting at noon along with a lot of uh, other competitors I don't believe Andrew Miller the Western States 100 champion uh, this year. Initially, I thought he had said he was going to sign up for it, but I, I never saw him on the list last I checked, so I'm not sure he's going to be there. There are other guys there uh, that have beaten me at Western States. Uh, I'm going to leave someone out here, I could tell. But uh, definitely guys like Jeff Browning, who was, uh, I believe, third at Western States. Um... The guy who was Jesse Haynes, who was 10th at Western States, who passed me in the last five or six miles there. Um, the, I think another guy to watch is Alex Nichols, who's uh, doing his first 100, but he's coming off a win at the Pikes Peak Marathon. He's a very experienced mountain runner, been doing a lot of shorter distance, short being a relative term, short distance mountain races. Uh, internationally, actually, he, has, he beat me head to head uh, in 2014 at Le Templier in southern France, this 45-mile race. Uh, he led Team USA ahead of me and then Zach Miller, uh, who kind of bonked in that race. I didn't have a, a great day there either. Uh, but Alex is really strong. He's won the 8K or 80K uh, Ultra in Chamonix uh, last summer, um, 80K mountain race. Uh, and yeah, it's just, you know, I'd always, I think he's been top 10 a couple years at the North Face 50 mile championships in San Francisco. I know he's a great climber. He's been second at Speed Goat 50K the last two years, and he's won the Pikes Peak Marathon uh, the last two years, I believe. So Alex Nichols, great guy uh, from Colorado, uh, making his 100 mile debut, and I think that'll be really interesting. Uh, I believe we have Tommy Rivers Pusey. Uh, yeah, out from uh, Oregon. I actually raced him in cross country in high school and he used to beat me. Uh, I believe he's racing. Um, Andrew Skirka, who was third last year and who is also from Colorado, who's uh, more into like the guided hike scene and mountaineering, but uh, very consistent and knows how to pace himself well. Uh, and what I've learned from these mountain races and then the women's field, which I won't go into as detailed, but uh, you could say the women's field at Run Rabbit Run is more competitive and stacked than the men's field. I think it'll be a closer race there. Um, originally, Claire Gallagher from Boulder, who won the Leadville 100, uh, I think was on the list, but I believe, last I heard, uh, that she was going to pull out of it, which is probably smart, having just won Leadville. Um, but there's there's a ton of other women's. Uh, Hoka teammate Nikki Kimball, uh, Anita Ortiz... Um, Amanda Basham, just, I'm just naming a few off the top of my head, I don't know all the details of the women's list, but I saw a rough list for Own Rabbit Run, uh, it's a deep competitive race, and you know, it should be, it's $12,000 to win, it's the largest prize purse that you could win in a North American Ultra, and probably the second most you could win that I could think of, besides, uh, comrades in any Ultra for that matter. Um, so yeah, it'll be a tough race, high altitude pushes up to close to, I think, 10,800 feet. And because of the noon start time for the hares, it's a guarantee that you're going to have to run pretty much all night. Um, if you run course record pace, I guess you could finish around 5 a.m., but, uh, it's going to be pretty dark and cold up there at altitude. 
uh, up above the ski slopes in Steamboat Springs, Colorado, which is already fairly high altitude. The good news, uh, which I think I like about the course, and you always want to analyze course profiles, you want to analyze the types of trails you're going to be running on, and you want to analyze the weather, the general weather patterns and uh, <clears throat> atmosphere that you're going to be racing in. So this race is notorious for being pretty hot and sunny at the start in the afternoon. If it's a nice Colorado day, it could be very warm. Well, warm being a relative term. If the sun's out, it, it you're sweating. Uh, guys were starting shirtless last year, for example. And then, you know, once that sun goes down in the mountains at altitude, a wind could blow in, there could be a, a rainstorm, um, the temperature usually drops a ton, and it, you know, it could get down into the 20s, 20 degree Fahrenheit, uh, definitely below freezing, and you're going to be in, in the dark out in the woods uh, on these trails and, and fire roads. Uh, now, the good thing for me with this race, compared to like Western States, I think, uh, is it's not a net downhill. I'm not particularly fond of net downhill races. That ended up not being a problem for me at Western States because I never really got to stress my legs out all that much since my stomach was holding me back the most. But uh, I think it probably would have been a little bit of a problem at least, and that is a big concern of even races like the Boston Marathon uh, being a net downhill marathon on the roads, that screws a lot of people up. So this race starts and finishes at the same elevation in the same spot. Uh, always a good thing. And then, you know, how the hills hit you, what miles the big hills and climbs happen at, that'll affect your strengths and weaknesses and your game plan for a race. Uh, the percent grade of the hills also affects things a lot. And the sheer amount of climbing uh, obviously is going to affect things. So, for example, we have races like UTMB, and granted I only made it about 60 miles at UTMB because of my injury, uh, but UTMB, fairly runnable trails, not super technical. There are more technical spots than I think people uh, give credit to, at least for Americans going over to Europe. Everything is a little bit more technical. But, you know, it's pretty buffed out for the most part, and you're running on pavement through through towns. Uh, but the sheer amount of climbing at UTMB, being over 30,000 feet of climbing, means that you're not able to run every climb. Even guys like Zach Miller, even guys like, I mean, Dave Laney, Tim Tollison, for American examples, those guys are power hiking uh, a bit, in, at least in the second half of the race. Uh, whereas in, in the Europeans, Luis Alberto, uh, Miguel Herras, uh, Xavier, uh, and they use trekking poles. A lot of people use trekking poles at UTMB because you're power hiking so much and you basically have to because of the sheer amount of climbing. That work output becomes not sustainable. Killian, uh, they'll, they'll power hike at UTMB. And it's not because uh, some of the all the climbs aren't runnable. If you had fresh legs, they would be, but you're trying to conserve energy. You're starting to get some really bad fatigue in your legs. Uh, and you're trying to pace yourself, so you're not trying to blow it out on every climb and running up relatively steep climbs for miles and kilometers on end is a pretty hard thing to do. So you get reduced to the power hike at UTMB and it's not because the hills are super steep. There are some pretty steep pitches though. I mean, it's it's the Alps, um, but it's not, you know, it's not super, super rocky and technical and super rugged. The reason people power climb or power hike is because of the sheer amount of vertical. Uh, in other races where it might be more technical or just a steeper pitch in general, Hard Rock 100, for example, and I've, I only know some of the course, I've obviously never raced Hard Rock, uh, you're up at, at 14,000 feet, 13,000 feet, super high altitude. You could be going up kind of some loose scree, off trail slightly uh, in some areas, at least for sure. Uh, pretty steep pitches, and so then, you know, that's a different ball game also. Uh, you're dealing with altitude, you're dealing with running all night again, you're dealing with uh, alpine environments up at, at very high altitudes. And altitude uh, is a kicker for a lot of people in races like Hard Rock or Leadville or uh, any mountain race, I guess, if you're coming from sea level, it could get pretty rough. Um, so yeah, different challenges with different races. So it's always smart to look in and see, you know, how could you prepare your gear? How could you prepare your race strategy? How could you prepare in your training 
to uh, you know practice exactly what physical demands are going to be placed on your body during the race, whether that's all from the weather, the altitude, the the slope of the climbs, and uh, descending a lot if it's a net downhill race, especially uh, how runnable the trails are, how technical the trails are, and trying to mimic that in your buildup weeks and weeks and even months in advance if you can to the you know to the extent that you can uh, to to maximize your your chances for success I guess um, I just realized I wasn't really looking at the the camera there for the YouTube video sorry guys uh, this isn't like a typical training talk I'm gonna just stare off into space because I'm doing it more for the audio uh, but yeah, it's for Run Rabbit Run, you know, I scouted out the course a little bit. I kind of know the lay of the land around Steamboat Springs, and I think that helps a lot. Um, and it is a lot of runnable stuff, and 18,000 feet isn't really crazy. It's it's similar to what Western States has for climbing, Western States being a net downhill race. Um, and, you know, the thing that surprised me about Western States, and this didn't really affect my race that much, but the first 30 miles at Western States is not is not buttery smooth single track. It, it is relatively technical, uh, rocky, um, mountain, high alpine trail running environment. It's, it's not a buffed out trail, the first 30 miles of Western States. Now, the last uh, 60 miles is pretty buffed out. Uh, and, of course, Western States, the unique challenge is or the heat in the canyons that, that could really screw people up and probably led a big hand in screwing me up uh, with my hydration issues, which I think ultimately led to my stomach issues. So I think a lot of people are probably wondering, going into Run Rabbit Run, they say, oh, so what are you going to do different? How are you going to make sure your stomach doesn't get all screwed up this time and you're not puking your guts out uh, like you were at Western States? Well, I think uh, I'm going to go out a little bit more conservatively, and I think that'll help. Uh, Western States, I knew it was a big chance, it was reckless, and I didn't actually know I was so far under course record pace. Uh, I just wanted to run a fast time and be in contention to try to win, and so that's that led to that, but it, it was too fast of a pace, uh, especially for your first, for my first hundred mile finish. I think that kind of uh, really hurt me and caused a pretty exponential blowout. Uh, and if you see Ginger Runner's film, you could see what went down there. Uh, Racing the Darkness on YouTube um, covers the, the my Western States race. So, yeah, changing nutrition, too, uh, is a big deal. And I think, you know, Run Rabbit Run's not going to be nearly as hot as Western States. So that automatically changes the dynamic of your nutrition plan. Uh, getting massively dehydrated might not... You don't want to do that in any ultra race, but... Obviously, if it's if it's 100 degrees or 90 degrees Fahrenheit and you're sweating a ton and way under course record pace and working really hard, uh, that's going to be a lot different than if you go out more conservatively, you're running in more moderate temperatures or even cold temperatures, and your your sweat rate uh, is going to change in, in, in different environments. So uh, nutrition, I wouldn't say it's less important. It's obviously always very, very important. Uh, but it's not quite as critical. You might not lose quite as much in electrolytes because the weather's different and because you're not working as hard if you're at a lower relative heart rate. So, uh, you know, that changes. I think I'm going to go with try to eat some more solid food. Uh, I've heard at Run Rabbit Run because it gets so cold at night. A lot of people have been saved by things like instant mashed potatoes uh, mixed with, with uh, broth or hot ramen soup or salty things like that that have easily digestible carbs, uh, but more solid things. I'm going to actually make some uh, rice balls, onigiri, onigiri uh, I can't pronounce that right, it's really sad, I lived in Japan for a year, uh, but rice balls uh, with some extra salt added. I'm Starting to find out I, I actually really like salt more, but the rice being a pretty nice digestible carb, hopefully if I could get it down. Uh, and again, and these things aren't foolproof, you know. I'm not admitting to being an expert. I want to redeem myself after doing so off my expectations at Western States. Uh, it was really disappointing for me, and to have that, those stomach issues has been really frustrating. Um, and you know, people like to point fingers, they're like, wow, you're eating too many carbs, you're not burning enough fat very well. Uh, I will take in fat during Run Rabbit Run. I have, I'm thinking maybe grabbing peanut butter jelly sandwiches from the aid stations, uh, if I could digest that. Um, as, as well as taking a lot of gels still. 
I'm gonna try to stay away from the Coke though. I've since I don't drink Coke nearly as much as I used to. Uh, gosh, when I was a little kid, I grew up drinking Coke all the time. I had an iron stomach because uh, I was used to drinking Coke. Now it's like uh, I never have Coke. I stay away from Coke. I don't even drink really sugary beverages. So to all of a sudden eat, you know, eat really clean and eat really healthy and not be used to eating junk food or refined sugars as much. When you start eating junk food and refined sugars, they taste great but your body kind of goes into shock now and it, it doesn't feel good. So like, you know, I love eating donuts, uh, for example, but if I don't eat as many donuts as I used to, uh, in college, I might've had donuts. I don't know, every other day, probably, uh, a lot of donuts and cookies, but you know, I don't do that as much now. And so every now and then if I, you know, gorge out on a dozen Krispy Kreme, I don't feel very good. That's that, you know, that's something that makes me feel sick. And so I think with the soda, uh, it could save your race. It could save a lot of people. But if you're not used to ever having soda and then you start drinking some soda uh, as, as, as combination with taking a bunch of gels because you think you need it during the race, uh, that could backfire on you. And I think that was also part of my problem. Uh, and it's been a problem uh, when I won the North Face 50 in San Francisco in 2014, the 50 mile championships. I had to puke and rally during that race. I was puking my guts out at about mile 35, 38. Uh, I wasn't feeling good from about mile 20 to mile 35 in terms of my stomach. Uh, and I had been in the lead that whole time, but I had I'd I'd had 20 ounces of Coke and combined that with a, a several gels simultaneously. Uh, and this was not a hot temperature race. It was actually a mud bath that year. Um, but you know, I didn't bonk, I was going high on sugar, but it just, the sugar rush turned my stomach, I think. And you know, I started puking, Dakota Jones passes me. I had to rally, catch him, uh, and then, and then contend, uh, to pull away for the win. But it was, that was nasty. Uh, and I'm lucky that I, the nausea didn't go with me to the finish line. Like at Western States, it, it obviously followed me all the way to the finish. So that was brutal. Uh, and that's really hard. So, you know, run, rabbit, run, different preparation. Uh, I'm also going to take more electrolyte tabs in my drink mix instead of just drinking plain water. I think that's the other thing that did me in at Western. Uh, I just wasn't thinking during the race. And again, I dumped out my electrolyte fluid. I had my parents were crewing for me at Dusty Corners around mile 40. And I had just burned this section from Robinson Flat, uh, mile 32, 33 down to about mile 40 uh, dusty corners. I got the Strava segment course record on that. And I was running a low six minute mile pace on a lot of that section. And you know, that, that when I got there, it was hot. I knew I was going into the canyons and I was just thinking, wow, I'm really thirsty. I should just drink some ice water. So my parents have my two Nathan bottles full of electrolyte fluid. And I'm like, dump it out, dump it out. Uh, just give me ice water and so they listen to me and I'm just chugging plain ice water but in reality I could have used some more uh, sodium and potassium probably and uh, you know that it just didn't quite sound appealing to me I think my stomach was already kind of on edge but it was more I was just so thirsty I thought my thirst would be quenched better by plain water uh, when in reality that could actually kind of make things worse for you uh, just drinking, I mean, people overhydrate, they load up on plain water and they actually dilute the concentration of electrolytes in their bloodstream. It could be a very dangerous situation. It's killed people uh, before races and stuff. So it's, but it, it, it kind of could lead to worse problems. And uh, then when you start throwing up, obviously you're losing fluid and getting more dehydrated and then not ingesting uh, calories very well. So it's it's a double whammy kind of uh, and that's, that's what I want to try to avoid at all costs at run rabbit run. Uh, I do have act some charcoal in case things really turn nasty, uh, that I'd probably take out of desperation. I've heard a ground charcoal powder is supposed to settle your stomach. Uh, cause gingins weren't pulling it for me at Western States. That's for sure. Um, so yeah, just trying to stay on top of nutrition, staying on top of hydration, pacing yourself better. Uh, and yeah, just going in with the mindset that this is my all day pace, you know, this is what I have to sustain pretty much all day. And for, you know, other people racing 
the uh, UTMB, for example, a lot of people spend two nights or almost two nights, one and a half nights out on the course. Uh, and so you really have to be thinking of it in terms of, can I keep this up for, for all day? Maybe almost two days. Can I keep this up, uh, you know, and keep the momentum going so that I don't have a huge meltdown and miss a cutoff or have to lay down on a cot for aid, at an aid station for hours on end? Uh, or be puking my guts out on the side of the trail because that's going to really affect your finishing time uh, and how you feel about that race. Um, so, you know, that's, those are my thoughts. And again, uh, you could chime in with comments and, and suggestions too. I, I'm welcome to hearing your experience uh, racing 100 milers because I know we got a lot of super experienced people uh, listening in to this podcast or watching this YouTube video. Um, and it's, yeah, it's nerve wracking. It's scary. It's hard to think that I'm going to do it again, that I'm going to run a hundred miles to try to run a hundred miles in the mountains. And, uh, it's exciting though, too. I've, I've ever since Western States, I wanted to redeem myself, I guess. And so this is me trying to prove to myself that I could finish a hundred mile or strong. And so I'm going to try to, I might fail. Uh, but you know, I'm, I'm going to give it my best out there and that's kind of what it's all about. And I, you know, the challenge of running all night with a headlamp, uh, you know, that's, it's there, the challenge of the temperature swings and the climbing and just, uh, finding out, you know, what, what you're made of and, and what you could do physically. And if this is maybe even a really bad distance for me to race or not. Uh, but it's, it's fun. It's fun to mix it up and the community is really great and supportive. So, uh, that's kind of why I think I was drawn to, to doing this race. Um, but after that, you know, I, I also in the back of my mind being coming from the road background and the track background, collegiate, uh, shorter distance racing, I should say, uh, is that I would like to get, try to touch on my speed and get some, some relative speed back after this, uh, depending on how the race goes and how the recovery goes. But, uh, you know, I still want to run road marathons. I still want to, uh, do short distance mountain racing, sky running, uh, those types of events. I, I love doing those because you could actually race more frequently. Whereas I think hundred milers, you really have to watch what you're doing because in terms of sustainability, it's, it's hard to race multiple hundreds in a year at a really high level and stay healthy and stay enthused in the sport. Uh, cause you could, I mean, mentally it's taxing, but also just physically what it does to your body. Uh, and the recovery being so long, it's, uh, it's hard to change it up and you do have to train or recover, but then train specifically for these different types of events. And obviously being in hundred mile peak fitness shape is a lot different than being in road marathon shape or even being in short distance mountain running shape. Uh, and when I say short distance mountain running, I'm talking about under 50 K. Uh, I know short is all a relative term at this point, but you know, doing races like the, the U S mountain running championships or the young Frau marathon or, uh, the, the sky running races, the rut, uh, speed goat, all these other races, Mount Washington, uh, that I really, really like, um, as well as, as the road marathons, you know, trying to qualify for Olympic trials or, or place well at Boston again, uh, or New York city marathon that, you know, those are all more bucket list things. Um, but yeah, I just realized I'm kind of getting away from hundred mile talk. Uh, so yeah, I, you know, going into this race, we'll see how it goes. Fingers crossed. Uh, there's no guarantees. And, you know, I could an overanalyze this. I could, I could say, you know, just Sandy's crewing for me. My parents are going to be there. So she, it's a lot of work to crew for someone, obviously. And the logistics are, you know, I just think you want to keep it simple and have changes in your plan. You have to be flexible because things are not going to go exactly according to plan, you know, something, there's going to be low points. You don't know when they're going to be necessarily. Uh, there's going to be issues where, you know, a headlamp battery was left on or, uh, all of a sudden you crave something sweet or you crave something salty. All of a sudden you, you realize you overdressed or underdressed. Uh, all of a sudden you realize you, you have to change socks or something. Um, all sorts of things could go down and, your crew has to, you, you want to have some flexibility, uh, in your mind already set, but at the same time, you don't want to have 20 different food choices when you come in at the aid station. Uh, well, if the aid station has 20 different food choices, that's great. <laughs> They're working really hard out there, the volunteers and, and the uh, aid station staff. But if your crew has too many things going on, sometimes that could throw you off too. And, uh, you know, it's, it's better to keep things relatively simple, but to have, 
uh, you know, change of plans ready uh, for what might happen. Because, you know, it's going to be a challenge. <laughs> it's going to be hard. There's, there's no way around that. And I think that's kind of part of the big draw to it. Uh, so, yeah, run, rabbit, run. I uh, could uh, hopefully I'll finish sometime early Saturday morning. Oh, I just realized my video died on my camera. But I'm going to keep the audio going. No, I'm going to stop it. All right, sorry there, folks. I uh, had to reset my camera. I ran out of space. But uh, to close this podcast out, uh, I'll just shift gears now all of a sudden to uh, the bias in scientific studies and opinions that I want to talk about in terms of diet and nutrition. And, you know, just bringing attention to the relatively obvious fact that we're all inherently biased. I'm obviously very, very biased, I admit to that. Um, and the system that we grow up in with our parents, with our neighbors, our community, what we read, what we've seen on, on social media now, and you know, in the, in the media, uh, what we like, what our taste buds like, uh, obviously shapes that, that bias, what industry we work in. Um, so it's, it's hard when you're debating controversial topics, be it diet, religion, sex, politics, um, it's hard to find common ground when people could be totally 180 from you. And that realization kind of that, that, uh, you know, no one's exactly on the same page that you're on, uh, 100%. Um, you know, there's always going to be slight differences in opinion and, and value systems and, and things like that. So, uh, it's really hard to logically present an argument maybe when, you know, another person's logic, so to speak, is is a different method basically than than what you're trying to say and i guess my point with this is to be skeptical of uh articles that you see online be skeptical of what you hear from me i guess uh you know full disclosure i'm not a doctor or nutritionist obviously but and opinions are my own um but it's a delicate subject and i think what we can agree on though in terms of diet and nutrition is that Eating more plants, uh, especially whole foods, you know, plants, whole sources of real food, uh, is generally more healthier, is more healthy for you. Uh, eating more vegetables is a good thing in general. And obviously you need a certain amount of macronutrients uh, and micronutrients, but obviously, you know, the ratios of protein, fat, and carbohydrates you know, differ slightly uh, or a lot between between people, but... Uh, as long as you're getting your essentials and you could get a lot of nutrient dense stuff from plants, uh, you're probably going to be doing pretty well. I don't think anybody ever said that, gosh, you're eating too many plants. Uh, you know, you need to look out. Now, if you eat the same type of plant all the time, I guess you could, you know, too much of anything is going to be bad for you. But uh, mixing it up, having that variety uh, is, is really key. Now, you know, plants aren't, aren't always the most tasty. I'll admit, even as a plant based athlete, you got to find good recipes and you got to be able to spice things up and, and change. Uh, but you do develop a palate uh, for things that you don't like sometimes after you've uh, conditioned yourself to eating more and more of them. And you don't feel like you're sacrificing that much really, uh, especially if you're you're seeing health gains and, and seeing changes in uh, where your food's coming from. And obviously we could also all agree on pretty much that highly processed food uh, the more processed it is, and if it spoil, if it doesn't spoil and has this really long shelf life, then it's probably not as good for you. Um, so you know, at least we have those commonalities. Uh, I think with with most people, and uh, you know, this got into the impetus behind this part of the podcast. I guess is just saying. You know, I'll tweet something out or I'll post something and people argue a hundred. You know, they're obviously coming in at the totally different angle, and I respect that. Because uh, it challenges us to think critically of, of what we've we've said or what scientific study we're citing, and there there are some shitty scientific studies out there. And this is, you know, I've I took stats, uh, high level calculus. Well, not that high level. I never made it to linear algebra <laughs> or different that many differential equations. But yeah, you know, I took stats and and calculus uh, at the collegiate level as well as nutrition classes at Cornell and uh, you know biology, uh, chemistry. Uh, at Cornell Labs, uh, lab-based classing. So, you know, I analyze some relatively, you know, a lot of scientific uh, studies and you look at for weaknesses in them. You look for bias and, you know, some studies are, you know, you see who the study's funded by. You see their, their sample size, things like that. Those are more basic things. 
uh, you see how they can manipulate data and we say that you know there's lies white lies and statistics so you can manipulate data kind of any which way you want to and so you know with scientists that are you know maybe have some financial incentive or they have uh, you know some all sorts of other uh, bias uh, you know you could see why some scientific studies should have more or are more valid than others and so being able to examine that more critically is really key and you know articles and all sorts of bs you see posted on on the internet uh you have to put it in context as well see where the site's coming from and you know this comes from me I, i'm admitting fully to being very biased i was, i grew up born and raised vegetarian uh, my dad was just out here visiting boulder actually uh this past weekend and he he started becoming a vegetarian uh, over 40 years ago when he was going to school out here at, at CU Boulder and he's been a vegetarian ever since uh, He weighs less than me. He's got low body fat. He's in great health. He runs uh, most days and he's, he's uh, 62 years old. He's training for his first ultra marathon this year now uh, and I know he could definitely go out there and, and finish one, but uh, yeah, you know, I'm I'm very biased. <laughs> I'll admit to that, and it's something I'm very passionate about. So I'm not going to stay silent on the topic. I know uh, a lot of you probably have differing opinions on that, but uh, I think that's pretty much all I want to say. Uh, I definitely want to get into more uh, interviews on this podcast, as well as running related content, and then you know some nutrition maybe every now and then, as well as uh, anything else that you guys would like to hear. Thanks so much for all the feedback. Thanks for the votes on on iTunes and, and the comments and thumbs up on YouTube and all the subscriptions uh again i i couldn't do any of this without you guys so you really uh thank you uh so much for for tuning in uh thanks for watching uh, i hope your training's going well and i'll let you know how uh run rabbit run goes after this weekend so uh thanks for listening and stay tuned for more sage running podcasts